as you can tell from the very first slide, you're in the right place if you want to know about Apache Spark. It'll be a do-it-yourself kind of talk. Um, I realize I've got quite a thick English accent from the north of England, home of Manchester United, which is obviously the best football team. I'm going to be talking to you guys about these kind of things. So I'm going to assume that you don't know much about Spark. Maybe you've heard about it. Sounds pretty good. How do I use it? What are the pitfalls? I've actually got some data to share with you guys um, from wearable devices. It's quite a lot of code. We're going to go as slowly as I can, but I still want to cover a heck of a lot of material. And I will put all of the slides into SlideShare, and hopefully there'll be a YouTube video afterwards. You also get my email at the end of this talk, so if there are any questions that you're too embarrassed to ask in person, for example, just email me and I'll help you out. There should be useful reference material for you, so when you go home or just on your laptop now, you can give this all a try. And I'm Adam, working in the Hursley Lab. This is a research and development lab in the south of England. It's about 2,000 to 3,000 employees, mostly software developers, as well as people from sales, for example, at IBM. So I'm going to keep this on here for a few seconds. Please don't try to read it really quickly. Uh, this is all accurate as of uh, 5 a.m. this morning. Uh, on this one, it's basically trademark usage. I call out a lot of projects. I'm not saying these are mine or IBM's. So motivation, why would we want to use Apache Spark in the very first place? I would say you want to do stuff yourself within your own time frame and your own rules. I would say that your findings elsewhere may be subject to some bias. There's this whole thing about fake news. I'm going to say trust the data yourself, um, find what's out there, and come to the real conclusion. And yeah, basically trust the data. So what cool projects are out there already involving Apache Spark in some way, shape, or form? There's a few of them. So pretty, pretty cool, pretty important. So finding aliens at the SETI Institute. Uh, some genomics projects. There's a, a toolkit out there to do this. And also there's Blue Mix Genomics as well. And a bunch of IBM Watson services. Uh, you might find that if you search for Apache Spark, IBM comes up and why are we even in this Spark game? The idea is uh, quite clear to me in that you can have these you know, 20 different teams all around uh, one lab and they're all doing analytics of sorts. The idea is that you improve Apache Spark, they all use Spark, you improve Spark and they would get a benefit. So they either upgrade their version of Spark um, over time and we make sure it works well, works fast, and that's what I've been doing in the team that I work in, in runtimes. But it's a common, common project if you're across IBM. You know, if you've got 300,000 employees, you don't want them all making their own solution. This is really the, one of the most important slides. Um, and also, I don't really use pictures much. This is a very rare case. Found that really nice toolkit over there, and I did accredit it at the bottom in a minute. So what you're going to need, powerful machines. Multiple is optional, but don't try this on a really old Windows machine with no RAM, you know, a terrible processor. Uh, Linux laptop's good. Uh, you can also try it on a Mac as well. You're going to need Apache Spark itself. That's a no-brainer. And a JDK. So open JDK, um, IBM's SDK for Java would all work with it. I'm going to be talking about Scala quite a bit today. Um, so who's actually used Scala before? Raise your hand. All right, so maybe a third of the audience, quite good. Um, I would say it's the main language for using Apache Spark. You're going to find a lot of examples written in Spark, a lot of the code base, sorry, written in Scala, a lot of the code base is written in Scala, um, and there are a few benefits to that as well, which I'm going to tell you about soon. Optional, visualizations. You could show somebody a big CSV file and say, well, here you go, here's the spreadsheet, enjoy. Or you can use something like um, a normal Python library. I'm going to use something called uh, Bokey in here and Pandas to do all of this for us, the visualizations. You can also get a notebook solution as well. A notebook solution like Zeppelin or Jupyter will handle the visualizations for you. And you can get Zeppelin with Spark already there in one big bundle. Those are quite nice things to have to do some analytics of your own. And this is something you can do on your laptop as well. 
And first of all, why even listen to me? So I worked on Spark since 2014. Um, I think it was about Spark 1.2 at the time. And the idea was, OK, Adam, this project is becoming quite popular. Um, can you go and test it? Can you go and see if it breaks? Uh, test IBM Java, because it's got about 12,000 tests. Make sure those all work OK. So did that for a bunch of platforms and a small team. Helping IBM customers use Spark for the very first time. So a lot of IBM customers are big banks, for example. And what we've done is we have Apache Spark on the mainframe. So these machines that cost you know, millions and millions of dollars to buy and then eventually to run over time, for example. Making sure Spark works on those platforms is important because traditionally you've got all your data on these mainframes for the past, let's say, 40 years. Now I want to analyze it, what would I do? I can write my own program if I wanted to, or can use Apache Spark, it's mostly in Java, written in Scala, but runs in J um, JVMs. So resolving their problems and service teams as well. So it was, quite, um, it was quite a new thing to IBM when I worked on Spark, and it was a case of, OK, everyone's now using it. Um, how do we fix their problems? So it was delivering some education to those teams. Um, we have level one to level three. Level three is really sort of the hardcore, um, you know, show me some uh, dump files, some code, I'll get debugging. And level two is more like usability, um, configuration issues, and level one is at a higher level. So helping those teams get started to fix bugs. Testing different platforms as well. So big Indian platforms where the byte ordering is a reverse when you do your reading, so from one end to the other. Testing on all of this was done, basically one big Jenkins job, um, one in Maven and Git. Fixing bugs in Java, so the Spark community, uh, very well tested with OpenJDK. With IBM Java, it was full of, uh, full of issues, basically, so segmentation faults in the JIT, for example. Um, things like using field names that are only there in OpenJDK, not in IBM Java. That was called magnitude, so it looks for a field we don't have and just falls over. Um, the worst thing was in Project Tungsten, which I might tell you about later. It's an internal optimization scheme they came up with, um, but they only tested it on these little Indian machines, so Intel x86. Mainframe, you try to access memory at where weird addresses, all falls down, segmentation faults, and you know, people aren't happy. Um, also with some Java performance shooting professionals, so some people working on the JVM for like 20 years plus. When we started working on this, it was about three times slower than open JDK. Um, now it's more like 10%, 20% faster on certain benchmarks. We use Highbench and Spark Perf as well. So I know a little bit about performance, but what I'm gonna show you is some code. With the main focus, readability. So what I'm gonna cover, what it actually is, uh, how to answer questions with Spark. I've got a few data sets to show you. And the core Spark functions that you need to know. This is the bread and butter, the meat and potatoes. If you go away with something, it's the toolkit, what Spark functions are actually any good and useful, how to support your data, and some machine learning in, uh, information as well. There's some built-in functions in Spark to make our lives a lot easier, and we should use those where possible. I'm going to show you some examples from wearables. So uh, it was a colleague of mine in the US, basically walking around and traveling around uh, all of America for the past two years. And he's got a bunch of different devices in his car and on his person. He would track his weight, uh, his blood pressure, his height, for example. Um, where is he going in his car? Has he been to the gym today? Has he gone to the supermarket? Is he you know, with his mum and dad? And just to let you know, I won't be showing you that person's data. It's all anonymized. Um, so you might find things like uh, poker stops and random addresses. It's not real data, but it's quite accurate. And please ask me later if you care about any of these things, which I won't talk about today. IBM specifics, um, again, our Java specifics. Notebooks, you want to know about Zeppelin or Jupyter. Um, come and talk to me. Using GPUs, I gave a talk on this yesterday. If you don't know how to use a GPU from Java or from Spark, please come and find me. Performance tuning. I gave a talk on this at the Spark London meetup, and that's all on SlideShare. So if you want to know about how to write really good Scala code or good Spark code, um, go to SlideShare, search for my name and performance. It should come up. 
other projects out there. So that you can do a big comparison with like uh, Apache Flink or Storm. I'm not going to in this talk because Spark has got a lot of attention and this is a Spark DIY talk. A lot of war stories as well. Uh, long story short, Spark uses a lot of other projects and we've got to test those projects as well. Things like uh, Netty and Jetty and all sorts of other projects that were never really tested well with IBM Java. So that was a lot of fun debugging those. Java 9 as well. If you want to talk about Java 9 and Spark, don't do it here. Um, come and find me and I'll talk about the, the fun to be had of Java 9 and Spark. I'm going to assume you know how to write Java and Scala programs. You've heard about Spark but never really used it. And you've got some data. It's just, I'm going to get Spark and you're nothing with it. This isn't a talk for you. You've got an idea of what you want to process. It's that really big CSV file, a really big JSON file. It's taking you years to process. You're going to use Spark instead. It won't make you a superhero. So you're going to find out that analytics is pretty hard to do. But writing an algorithm that will work on a cluster, that's kind of done for you in Spark. So there are different things to worry about instead that I'm going to tell you about. So you know more about Spark, what you can realistically do. Uh, machine learning, still hard, but in different ways. So there's the logo. You've probably all seen it before. Open source project, machine learning, graph processing, and those core functions, the bread and butter. It's also got a nice SQL syntax for data frames and data sets. Out of interest, who's using Spark already? OK, great. So like maybe two people. Good. How do you actually get Spark in the first place? Uh, you can build it yourself from source code using a basically git clone, a maven command, either JDK, obviously. You can get a community-built binary, which will have it all built for you and works out the box or get our development package where you get a JDK and Spark itself, and we've tested it to make sure it works OK. You find an issue, you can go into developer works and say, hi, Adam, this thing you just told me about doesn't really work. Can you go and fix it, and I'll get on the case. What can you actually process in Spark, then? Things you can use of Hadoop normally. So for example, um, let's say CSV files, let's say JSON files, Parquet, plain text files, you can process that sort of thing. There's also Spark packages from file formats as well you can find and give them a try. So JSON, CSV, Parquet is what I mentioned already. And you can use it things like Kafka, so for streaming data, um, Hive tables, different Apache projects basically. So Cassandra um, or Hadoop itself as a sort of distributed area where all of your Spark processes can pick up data from this HDFS place. Also, uh, DB2, anyone using DB2? OK, I didn't think so. That's IBM database, and that's on a lot of mainframes. What's so good about it? You get scalability and resiliency to an extent. So it uses these things called RDDs. And there's a really good paper on this online by the, well, the Spark creators. Auto compression, really good to have. Um, and fast serialization. Caching results as you go is also really useful, unlike with tr traditional MapReduce, where you're writing and reading to disk aka being quite slow compared to reading from memory. And you can use Python, R, Scala, or the Java APIs. Distributed machine learning is the main selling point. Why is everyone using it then? Sounds pretty good. Not every problem is going to be a Spark, uh, a Spark problem. So you might have these sort of things. Maybe you should use spreadsheet software, OpenOffice, um, Excel. Maybe it's not a big file. Is it really a large amount of data? And then data preparation, where I'll tell you about this today, that is going to be where you actually have to think and say, how do I deal with negative values in my data? How about all those nulls everywhere? Um, will Spark handle them OK? And I'll tell you how to do that. And then will you benefit from running things on many machines at once? Maybe you've just got one machine of all the hardware you need, but your other machines are all, they can't do the job. So you need to make sure it's actually it's going to be a scalable workload format you can work with, so let's say CSV, and doesn't need transforming first. If you satisfy um, the main criteria for Spark, sure, it's really good, but it's not the be-all and end-all. It's also not really real-time streaming. Um, this is a known uh, sort of complaint of Spark. If you want to get like a two millisecond response of Spark, it's going to be quite hard to do. Um, more like 30 ms, 40 ms, that, sort of, um, that sort of figure. So you might be able to say, OK, 
I use my credit card. I wait 30, mi uh, 30 milliseconds, that's fine. If you want perfect real time, Spark's OK, but not quite there compared to things like Apache Flink. Um, debugging in this massive system with many machines can be quite hard to do. And security. Um, there was a recent mailing list comment about Spark security, basically saying, how do I have Spark security? I think one of the accepted answers was basically to have a uh, whole disk en encryption or to set up uh, you know, other solutions with different projects. So out of the box, it might be a bit hard to do. Quick example here. You've just got Spark for the first time. Looks like that. Essentially, it's going to be a bunch of different folders with jar files in there that you can point to your class path. There's going to be a bunch of scripts for you in the bin and sbin directories. The very first uh, thing you might do is figure out what pi is. And there's some code that would actually work to figure that out for you. The last number is how many iterations to use, 100. And then you want to scale it out. You would basically add, um, add your host names in this one file, conf slash slaves. You would start up a cluster of that script and then specify dash dash master. That is going to tell your job to run on your master, which might be you know, 10 machines, 100 machines, not just your little laptop. You also get a Spark UI as well, but I won't talk about that today. Going quite quickly now, you can get, um, you get a REPL, so you get a nice Spark shell. You can also just use it on the class path in your existing Java programs. And the PySpark API is pretty good. It's quite well tested now. So if you're a really big fan of Python, go ahead and use PySpark. Here's a simple example where you just say um, dash dash master and then run in local mode with one thread. It takes about, let's say, three minutes to do a word count with a 5.2 gigabyte text file. You change the number from a one to a four. It's faster. It's scaled out for you. You've used more threads. Anything else good? Yeah, you get your resiliency because it basically keeps a track of the operations done on your data. Um, uh, so I need some work from this node, that node's gone down, fine, I know what I was going to do, I'll do it on that node instead. Distribution of processing by different workers, caching is really useful, and versatility. So because it's Java-based, written in Scala, remember, I can use it with things like my own Java applications. Different APIs as well, and you can mix and match these. If you want to know more, I recommend these, uh, that material at the bottom. So there's really good videos by Andrew on machine learning and a lot of good deep dives out there. If you want to get hardcore with Spark, check out the Databricks deep dives on Catalyst and Tungsten. This has got to be a DIY talk. So now we know what it is. I'll use my analytics for the very first time. Let's do that then. We've got one CSV file with road accidents. I went to uh, Kaggle, really good place to get some data sets. Um, data that I'm using is under this license the Open Government License for Public Information. We've got some questions to ask, but first, what should it actually look like? Well, you get this massive um, list of columns. These are all features in the data. You get, for example, an accident index, a, a vehicle reference, a vehicle type. These would all map to different values. So think of it as a spreadsheet. You've got Excel open. These might be columns in Excel. We care about the vehicle type the maneuver, age of casualty, and the weather conditions. So here are the values. So these values correspond to those columns. These are rows in your spreadsheet. So that first thing there, that 2015, would be the accident index, and the vehicle reference would be two, and it's all in that, that kind of order. So that makes sense, hopefully, so far. So which type of vehicle is in the most accidents? It's data from the 19, uh, 1975 onwards. And all I want to do is figure out this answer in Spark. So we're going to do a group by, I'm going to show you the code soon, group by vehicle type. You're going to sort the results, and then the vehicle type might be a code. You might have one being a car, two being a moped, three might be a pedal bike, maybe four is a tractor. First place, you can probably expect this. Most things on the road will be cars, first place. Distant second, pedal bikes. Third, vans. Uh, distant last electric motorcycles, probably not many of them around, or maybe they're safer drivers. What weather should I be avoiding then? Well, weather conditions maps to a code. The Spark way should look familiar by now. You do a group by um, on weather conditions, that's a column in our database. You sort the results, and first place, 
five no high winds. Again, this is kind of sensible. People are on the road more often at this time. Second is raining if no high winds. Distant third is fine with high winds. And distant last is snowing, maybe because you're staying indoors. So it's kind of making sense so far. So which maneuver should I be extra careful doing? I'm on the road, I want to, be, you know, I want to not die today. I want to try something, try and be careful. So again, group by and sort. So really easy so far. Um, first place, going ahead, no brainer. Last place, you're really, really going to be safe if you reverse him. That's good to know. So I'm just using these spark functions here with an asterisk over them. Why has it got an asterisk over it? You just ask that. You can run in a distributed way. I'm going to use these org Apache spark functions. And if I am using them, they can run on many machines um, at once, maybe 10 machines, 100 machines. Here's a, there's going to be a graph coming up now. So which, um, what sort of age group it most, like, most likely be an accident at? Is it going to be you know, 10, 20? Uh, when do you first start learning to drive? Let's say it's 17 or 18. So I'm going to be using Scala here now. You have to care about mutability. So you've got to put either val or var before your variable declarations. Val is essentially going you know, to be final. It's not going to change. Var, it can change. Um, you don't have to declare your types in Scala or add the return statement. A really good video called Scale for the Entry on YouTube. Recommend checking that out. And it is Java based. I'm going to use a main method in Scala. It looks like this one. It's not that dissimilar from a Java main method, apart from you've got def there, so the public static void. And your return type uh, is going to be unit, which goes over there at the end. So a little bit different, but not too hard so far. Then you actually start using Spark for the first time. So in this case, I'm going to say, I want a, uh, a Spark session builder object. I'm going to call my app Accidents. I'm going to run it on my, my local machine, my laptop. As many threads as you can. That's the asterisk there. So it's going to run on you know, 20, 30 threads, however many I've got. We're going to use a data frame. A data frame is how we talk to our data as though it was a table in SQL. So I'm going to get a SQL context. And I've got that file on disk somewhere, accidents.csv. You load up as a table. And then you can show the table, and you would get something like this. So if you know SQL, big head start for Spark. We're going to group our data and then save the result. So in this case, I've got my own function here in Scala, def, uh, group, count, sort, and show. We do group by, which is a Spark function on a data frame. We give it a column name. Remember, I changed the column names based on the question. And then if I want to show it, I'll show it. You then call a Python uh, application to plot the data. You save uh, the file first, though, as a CSV file. So you just process the data, write it to disk, and then plot it. What you get, well, first of all, there's a question about that get runtime. I'm calling a Python program from Java this way, is, I'm going to show you the graph first. Something like this. Accident victims by age. Uh, you got how many on the left? age of victim on the bottom. So unfortunately, there are you know, quite a lot of victims before the age of zero. They probably are categorized as you know, not yet really born. Uh, well, born, but maybe, you know, really young, basically. Um, then you've got the massive one at the top there is maybe you turn 17 or 18. You just start driving. No brainer here. Lots of accidents for you. If you're uh, 105, uh, not many people in those sort of accidents. So that data. Kind of makes sense. Um, I did this in Python to plot it using that library called Bokeh, remember? And the main bit to focus on is I'll put those nice rectangles over. You read CSV files in. There's only one of them, by the way, in this case. Um, and you say, I want my font size to be 16, uh, 16 point. And then you create a scatter graph. And you tell it which columns to use on age of casualty and how many. Then it will open up in your web browser as a HTML file. So making sense so far, hopefully, you get a nice graph. So what else can I actually do in Spark? JSON files, sure, we can uh, handle those as well. These are all made up band names. So I went onto a random band name generator. Um, if they become great bands, I've got now to do with them. I don't know these bands, if they do exist. One of the best doom metal band. Well, what you can do here is load up your JSON file. You can then uh, create a temp view, basically a, a little table to use. 
and then you can do an SQL query on that with the .sql function. I'm just going to select the name and the average rating where the genre is what I want, so doom metal. And then I'm going to start by the average rating. In this case, great band Bugle Infantry number one, fantastic. This is all handling JSON files, no problem. You got some machine learning to do though. Now, I did mention wearables. We're going to get to that. So I've used uh, different data sources um, in this presentation. So Automatic, Apple Health, uh, and those two other ones. I'm not affiliated with these in any way. I've never really um, used them. My test subject in the US has, um, so I'm not you know, endorsed by these companies. You've got car journeys, you've got sleep activity, how many calories were consumed, how many steps were taken, the weight and heart rate over time. It's in a bunch of CSV files. And it's all anonymized, remember? So you can get into a lot of trouble if you were to put someone's personal data on a server, um, something called SPI laws, probably, you know, go to jail, uh, get fined for loads of money. So don't do that. We're going to explore this data set first. First function you're going to do, um, it's going to be a show. But in this case, let's just look at the file as it is. Looks like this, you want to make sense of it. So somebody's driving around in this Nissan Sentra. Poker stops, it's all anonymous by the way. Home, so maybe it was a real address. Now it's a poker stop. Um, I'm going to read that file in, just like before. I'm going to rename these columns. They've got spaces in. Terrible. We want just a one word, uh, no spaces, column name, please. So I do that with the with column renamed functions. Is it actually sensible before we do any machine learning? Is it junk data? I'm going to do some Scala functions here on the right. So I've got a summarized function. You give me a data frame, you give me a column name, I'm going to give you the minimum, maximum value, and an average. And then I call this over here on the left. So for each column I care about, distance, duration, and fuel cost, give me a summary. Average distance in mild, it's OK, so 6.8 miles. Maximum, 187, making sense, this looks OK. Duration, still OK. Fuel cost, in the US, very, very cheap for fuel over there. So our data is good, sensible, passes all of our tests. So what's the rate of our Mr. X visiting a certain place? Is he slacking in the gym? Is he never going? We're going to find out. We're going to use Spark to do all of this for us. Um, one big issue here is timestamps. We've got a massive time, um, and all we want is basically the day. So we want a day, uh, a location, and we can then process that. The start of a common theme, by the way, is preparing the data for analytics. We're going to explore the data first. This should be your favorite function, dot show. And when I call dot show, something like that. So we've got to make sense of this. This is our challenge in Spark now. So again, you can see that timestamp there. You can see 4 slash 3 slash 2016. So let's say it's uh, 4th of March, different formats, remember. Um, and then you've got the time, so 3.06 PM. We don't really care about the time. We just want a day. I want Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. How do I actually do that? SQL query. It's not really a very funding of timestamps, by the way, but you can do it in Spark, and it'll run on many machines at once, so hopefully it'll be quite quick. I'm going to say, you see that, uh, that time column? Call it date, and just give me the month, month, day, day, year, 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 year format. So basically, I'm going to show you a picture soon, and uh, that'll make sense. I want days. You use good old E to go from uh, dates to days and then show that. So now we've got data looks like this. We've got dates, we've got locations, we've got days. We can handle this sort of, uh, this sort of data now. Scala function. Give me all the rows where the day is what I got asked for. I want to know about Mondays, let's say, or Tuesdays. Scala method coming up here. Um, so Scala method at the top, and you've got parameters here. SQL contacts, what day you care about, what location. I'm going to say Monday in gym, for example. I'm going to get all of the sleep and days logged first into one big table. So you know um, all the activities I've ever recorded. I've got 50 Mondays. We went to the gym on 10 of those Mondays. That's useful. We can figure out you know, there's a one in five Monday gym visit chance. We show that data as we go. It looks kind of like this. That distinct function is important there. Maybe you went somewhere uh, you know, 10 times in, 
in one day on the Monday. I don't really want to know that. I just want to know how many Mondays you've logged. So I use distinct in this case. Rows where the location and day matches. Um, in this case, I will do that SQL query there at the top. And you can see location, gym. And then you will then figure out the rate of them visiting the gym on that day, uh, just like that along the bottom. And then I'm going to ask it the questions. Every single day, has this subject been a slacker? What's the rate of them going to the gym on those days? Well, 7% chance on Monday, not that great. 51 Mondays I got data for, not that good. How about Tuesdays? 1% rate. And it gets uh, not much better on Wednesday, 2%. Thursday, it's OK, 6%. No Friday, you've never been to the gym on a Friday. So if you wanted to find this guy at the gym, don't go on a Friday. Saturdays, 7% rate. Uh, Sundays, 9% rate. So it's a bit of a mixed bag. So the slacking, what about correlations? How do you do it in Spark? If one feature changes, there's another um, increase or decrease with it. Quite easy to do in Spark. Um, we've got these features to look at. The sleep duration this time. So we've got all of his data for sleeping as well as where he's driving. I want to know how long you go start asleep for, um, how you are active during the day, how many calories you've used, so walking about, for example, distance you've just traveled, how many steps, total calories consumed. Um, num then this bedtime um, might relate to sleep time. And then the awake time. I'll actually do this in Spark them. I'm going to compare things to this column called S underscore duration. For each column in your data set, um, if it's not you know, going to compare itself to itself, that S duration to itself, or it's compared to other, other functions, um, so other columns, you would do dot stat dot core, so a correlation. You're going to figure this out. You get a number back from that. If it's a, uh, you know, quite a high number, above 0.8, um, it's going to be 0 to 1. It can go negative as well. It's going to be a strong positive correlation. Otherwise, normal, normal correlation, positive. So obviously, this is making sense again. The bedtime is related to um, how long it was asleep for. So this is very simple using correlation. What we know isn't related is the goal body weight um, and then the sleep duration. This should be a very, very tiny number, not at all related, um, no correlation there. What you would get is 0.02, uh, minus 0.02, so not related. So this is making sense from a, um, you've got some data, I want to get some obvious conclusions. So, can Spy hope to get a good night's sleep? Well, maybe. Let's have a look. We need to define what a good sleep is. So for this gentleman, it's going to be eight hours. So if the duration of your sleep is eight hours or more, it's in seconds, by the way, so I'm just going to put a greater than sign um, for efficiency in this case. Good sleep is true, otherwise it's false. I'm going to use one for true, zero for false. We're going to label this data soon, so machine learning will rely on labels. We're going to determine the most influential features on a value being true or false using machine learning. Interesting stuff can come from this. Are there any good sleeps for this person? Have they ever slept for more than eight hours? Um, here's how I figured this out. I basically get the, uh, the amount of seconds that good sleep is. So it's going to be 60 times 60 times eight. So 60 seconds in a minute and 60 minutes in an hour. I want eight hours. Then do this filter function here. Give me all of the cases where the duration is more than or equal to the threshold. And then you would then um, say how many sleeps were there in total with this other dot filter function. Yeah, they've got some you know, good sleeps uh, quite a lot of times. They slept for a total of 538 times on record. And uh, nearly, a, let's say, a quarter to a fifth were quite good sleep. So they're OK. We can use this. We're going to use machine learning to actually figure out uh, how to get a good sleep now. What do we want to find out first? How to get a good sleep. Main factors, what influences it. We're going to pick an algorithm. There's lots to use uh, in Spark. You're going to prepare your data. You're going to separate that data into training and test data. You're going to build a model with the training data, and then use that model on the test data. And you're going to evaluate the model. You're going to check if it's actually any good or not, any, if it's even accurate. 
and you're going to experiment with parameters. So how many iterations to run your algorithm for? Maybe one is OK. Maybe it needs to be really, really accurate on 100 iterations. What might be of use to us here? So recommendation algorithms. Uh, maybe you've used Netflix or YouTube or Spotify. And we can say, Adam likes this movie. Um, chances are his, his friend that likes a similar movie also likes, basically, uh, let's give an example. Adam likes Jumanji, he likes Mortal Kombat, he likes Blade. He's got a friend called Steve, he likes those three same movies. He likes Lord of the Rings, The Two Towers. Maybe they're similar movies. Chances are Adam also likes Lord of the Rings. You can infer that with this algorithm called alternating least squares. That's what Netflix probably uses behind the scenes. Um, Amazon as well, so your friends bought this, they're like you, you might want to buy it as well. We get this in Spark. Clustering algorithms like k-means, for example, um, and classification. We're going to use classification algorithms, one called naive Bayes, to figure out the uh, good sleep chance based on some new data. So if they've not gone to the gym, did they get a good night's sleep or not? We're going to find out. Different examples here, but this is a later material. What does this naive Bayes algorithm actually do, and how can it help you get a good night's sleep? So what it does, it will say, you've got these labels, 0 and 1. I've got some evidence as well. I've got some, uh, some, some facts. I want to predict with these facts there will be a, a 1 or a 0, the label. And all I need is your training data. That's pretty much it. So a lot of examples from this libSVM format. On the far left is a label, 1 or 0. And then you've got these three columns. This might be scoring for, let's say, a some athletic event. I want to say, if the numbers aren't very big, it's probably going to be a, it's a low-scoring athlete. If numbers are quite big, it's a high-scoring athlete. But I want to use an if statement. It's got to be all relative. So a lot of examples are in this format. We're going to read in the data. We're going to split the data. So 70% training, 30% test. We're going to use this algorithm, naivebase.fit, on your training data, and then um, use that model on the test data and then see if it's any accurate or not. So in this case, there's an 82% chance of getting the label prediction correct. You can read more about that algorithm online on the Spark docs. I want to then find some new, um, some new predictions. I give it some brand new data, and with that existing model I just built, I do dot transform, and look at these numbers here. So the 700 ones are going to be quite high. And you will um, see the predictions. So for example, one mistake on this slide, you see that 700, the third one, that should be a 200. That maps down to this table at the bottom where you've predicted the label or not. So one was high scorer, zero was low scorer. You ran the algorithm, you got this table that's using machine learning in Spark. And that'll run on many machines at once. So we can just use this on all my sleep data, right, and be done. Well, not really. You've got to label the rows first, what is a good sleep or not. Um, I told you about it, but I actually do it earlier. Data might have negatives in. No good for naive bays. And there's like 50 features in this data set. I only probably care about 10. We're going to think about those useful and useless features as well. We're going to label each row now. Remember that good sleep criteria? It was uh, eight hours or more is good, one. Less is zero. There's a map function in Spark, but if I try this map function, I only get one column, good sleep or not. Pretty useless, so it's on a good sleep. Um, there's also a user defined function. You can write your own functions using Spark. The thing is, the SQL optimizer called Catalyst probably won't optimize it for you, so this might be slow. So I'm not going to do that. What we're instead going to do is, remember what I said earlier about a good sleep, eight hours or more? We're going to do a new data frame is your existing data frame dot with column duration. When the duration is more than the threshold, we replace that data with a one, otherwise just a zero. This is labeling the data. The features is easier. You want labels and features in machine learning. Built in class here called uh, the vector assembler. Just do it on all the columns, sleep data dot columns. So the label of data is now this. Good sleep, zero or one. Great, we want that. The features over there on the right um, was the result of that previous, previous slide, basically. Labels and features, great. Number one, done. Data in its current form might have negatives. 
what will that do? Well, if you try to use the model now, it's going to fail for that reason. How do I handle it? I've got negatives in here. Well, in their API, they've got a sleep time and bedtime. And they tell me that can be a negative number for your bedtime and your sleep asleep, your S asleep time. So we're going to make them all positives. One thing to say here, when you're doing machine learning for real, don't be lazy like me. All I do here is basically just um, add the number of seconds in a day. I basically just do an, uh, an ad. I'm going to show you in a minute. It's terrible. Don't copy me. So you get a new data frame here, and so I handle it. I basically just do S asleep time plus number of seconds in a day. So like maybe it's minus 10. I just add 85,000, whatever it is to it. Maybe it was a plus 10. Um, just add it as well. This is not that good. So 10 minutes to go, making good progress. So I've handled that, bit of a hacky way. Useless features, like, like 50 columns, I want 10. How do I do that? Fancy way, reducing your feature space. Um, you get this chi-square selector algorithm, and basically you want the labels and features to put into this algorithm. And the data at the moment looks like this. You've got feature one, you've got um, a sleep duration, some more features as well. We want good sleep, which is the label stuff familiar, remember? Um, and eventually, you would just want these two things, the label and the features. There's a lot of noise in our data. I don't care about certain things for figuring out if you've got a good sleep or not. I've collected like, your travel information, where you're going to work, I'm not sure at this point. Here's how you use the algorithm. And because it's a Spark function, this will run distributed on many machines. I basically say, I want 10, 10 features that are really important for sleep. Um, and we'll say the label column is good sleep. That's a one or zero, remember? <coughs> I'm going to do the dot fit and then tell me what are the top 10 contributing factors to a good sleep. Well, here's how I'm going to do this. You've got to use that vector assembler again to get the features out of the data. Um, it's built in a built in class, that vector assembler. And what you would get is this. Let's just go back this way. Top 10 influential features for getting a good night's sleep. Well, there's a sleep count. Not really that useful. Awake time, yeah, you'd guess that. Sleep quality, that's there for pipes formula. Don't know how it works. A sleep time itself, don't really care about that. Bedtime, don't really care. Number of deep sleeps. However, in real light sleeps, workout time, that's pretty influential apparently. So maybe if Mr. X went to the gym more, he'd get a better night's sleep. So this should, again, make sense. Uh, it's quite uh, you know, realistic to expect. So we've crossed out all these three things now. We're good. We can then generate predictions. I'm going to say, right, like I said before, training data, test data, create a model with that training data, use it on your test data, and tell me how accurate it is. In this case, I got an 81% chance for this test subject of predicting your good night's sleep or not. And I give it some brand new data in this case. I say, right, I want a new data frame. It's going to have these values in. These values would map to features. So it might be um, the amount of deep sleep they had. It might be the workout time, when they went to bed. And you can tell in this case that when I give it, I give it two records, basically. First record, high workout time, you went to bed early, should be a good sleep. Second case, well, you woke up early, wasn't much of a deep sleep, and you didn't even work out, you went to bed pretty late as well. Probably not a good sleep. We then transform it to get the predictions, and lo and behold, if you maybe need a telescope at the back, basically you get the predictions on the right, correctly predicting if your brand new data a good sleep or not. So that's machine learning in Spark and how you can do it for yourself. Bear in mind, this model knew nothing about sleep itself. It's just, there's no domain specific knowledge. There's no sleep expert. It's just here's some data, go and predict the label. Enough of Mr. X and their sleeping. Final example for you. So do we always need to go that deep into Spark, machine learning? Well, maybe not. If you weigh more, is your heart rate higher? I'm going to get the average of all your heart rates over time. And if it's a lower heart rate day, then the weight was more, we'll check that. Higher rate day was the weight less. Maybe machine learning. Maybe. There's got to be a twist to this. If 
going to have to get rid of, again, those pesky times. I just want something like this on the right. Date and weight. The weight there is in pounds, by the way. I want the heartbeat ratings if I also know your weight on that day. Otherwise, get rid of it. I've got nothing to compare it against. I'm going to average the rate and heart weight readings by day. So if it looks like that, you know, you know same date, um, your weight fluctuates a little bit and your heart rate's fluctuating a little bit. Just give me the average. And then you get something like that. Now that looks to me, there's a CSV file at the bottom, something you can put into a graph. We will do exactly that. And you can see from there, there's not really a massive correlation. So at this point, I'm going to say, fine, I didn't need to do machine learning. I didn't need to prepare my data. I just did a few filters, uh, maybe a join. Uh, I'll tell you on the next slide. And it looks like that. So I abandoned ship at this stage. Fine, no real correlation for this subject. Abandon ship. I use the same functions that I've shown you earlier. You can do loads of this data. Those are some examples. Um, we're going to move on quite quickly now. We're running out of time. Analytics, analytics does not need to be complicated. You can use Spark with heavy lifting. Just plot as you go. We don't need to use machine learning all the time. Other harder things to worry about. You should now know more about Spark, more about machine learning, maybe you've got some new project ideas. Um, it's still hard to do, but in a different way. I don't have to write that big algorithm myself. You've got to prepare your data, handle junk, and know what to look for. Oh, and by the way, you actually need someone that's collected all this data and willingly gave it to the process. This question becomes a lot easier. What can I actually use to analytics? Maybe use Spark. So I've got to think about this sort of thing. I'm just going to do it quite quickly now. Big, I'm going to say big ass. A massive cluster. Loads of Spark, um, Spark enabled machines. Maybe it's like 50 machines, 100 machines. How do you actually do that? It's going to be talking it's all right. If you've got a really a show off, deep running for J, it's got GPU support. You can also write your own kernels as well. Use IDMA, performance benchmark, this sort of thing. Um, go tackle something huge. So maybe join the search to find aliens with the SETI people. Takeaways, still pretty hard. But the bigger picture is thinking about where Spark will fit into your existing systems. And you can get Spark for yourself quite easily. So just show you these two slides. If you want to do it yourself, that's how I got the data. I'll keep it on there for the video. And second one, there you go. OK, so are there any questions for me? OK, so you're all experts on Spark and machine learning. You're all inspired, happy. If you have questions, come and talk to me during the break, and I'll be glad to help you out. Thank you very much.